You guys are making progress, huh, Dave? Yeah. Getting a little warm for them. At 510, are you getting your folks in there okay? Affirmative. Uh, they're trying to get organized. Well, you better tell them to hustle it up. That finger's heading right toward your tail right now. Affirmative. Are we, are we still on hold, George? Are we cleared? You're still on hold. we got to get that helicopter out in front of that thing off the ground first. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing the best I can, George. I'm trying to get them motivated. Not going to be, Mike. Uh, that's getting going to be pretty hot right behind your tail here for a, in a minute here. And uh, if, uh, if they can't get their stuff in gear there and that starts picking up speed, you might want to just load them up and clear them. I understand. Just that little waiting right there uh, changed our strategy here now. That thing really broke out of the perimeter, didn't it? Yeah. Full IC, engine 2260. BLM, scene of action. Mike, I guess I just have to tell you this imperative. Get those guys in and get them out of there. We're on Smoke Creek Ranch Road. Uh, is there a marker? Hi, Dan, did you copy that up there? Get them on the helicopter. They're not reacting on the main road coming into Bull. Uh, zero, Dave. Six, tanker 12, we're on yeah, downwind. You want us to get something between the helicopter and that fire? Yeah, let's go try it. All right, Mike, we're going to come right across between the head and you with that tanker right now. Just stay on the ground right there for a second. Uh, thank you. Dave, uh, get your folks on that helicopter now. I'm pulling off to the left just as soon as, in about 10 seconds. 10 seconds, I'm coming out airborne. Yeah, get that helicopter. You got your folks out of there? Affirmative, we're all up. Okay, thanks. Now. Okay, hold on, Twelve. He's coming out to the west, and he's got his folks on. Okay, just warming up, guys. All right, Twelve uh, and Zero Five, you see the helicopter bending to the west? And uh, what we've done is we're going to go ahead and change strategies now. As the heel of the fire is on the west side, we want to take the right flank where it starts to burn hot and carry it on toward the east. Or if you want to come back against the wind, uh, it might be a little smoky. We'll start flanking hey, this thing as it's blowing out. out safely, and I'm mad as hell at them. <laughs> okay, Mike, thanks for your help there. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. Hence, his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. He wins his battles by making no mistakes. Twenty-five hundred years ago, the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu outlined the first recorded military theories, a book of strategies and tactics that continues to be used in military training today. What has made Sun Tzu's writings timeless was his focus. His theories were not concerned with the latest technological advancements, but rather they concentrated on the human aspect of waging war, the art of directing and coordinating an army. He wrote about making tactical decisions, keeping up morale, and assuring good communication. This was not an easy task. In Sun Tzu's time, keeping an army of more than 100,000 soldiers coordinated communicating and ready for action was difficult. The struggle was a human one. In the following 25 centuries, empires rose and fell based on the decisions of their kings, leaders, commanders, and soldiers. Throughout history, the importance of the human factor is a lesson that has been continuously learned, forgotten, and learned again. The lessons were not limited to the battlefield. History has ample records of great expeditions, projects, and adventures that succeeded or failed on the decisions, actions, and reactions of the men and women involved. In our lifetime, we've witnessed amazing technological advancements. For example, message runners, which were used until the early 1900s, are now replaced by radios and satellite data links but under all the technological advancements lies this core truth. 
the controlling mechanism is still the human mind. Through modern technologies, we've extended our control over our environment to unparalleled levels. But just as human abilities to think and reason can be turned into great accomplishments, common human errors can result in great failures. Now more than ever, we realize that as the use of advanced technological tools increases, so does the responsibility to manage and hone our mental tool set. Advanced technology does not excuse us from thinking, but rather, advanced technology provides us reason to think harder. Although improvements in technology have eased our lives in countless ways, it has also enabled us to work and play in new extreme environments. Here, the difference between life and death depends as much on the strength of your mind as on the amount of high-tech equipment you take with you. Today, more than ever before, people are engaging in high-risk activities in extreme environments. Many are drawn by the personal challenge. For others, it's their business. Those who become the very best at functioning in these extreme environments are the ones who constantly strive to improve their performance and skills. Working in an extreme environment is difficult enough for one or two people. But what about having to work in an extreme environment with many people? Across the world, countless organizations face the daunting task of coordinating the actions of many people in high-risk work environments. Reducing risk in these work environments means anticipating human error, so it can be avoided whenever possible. And when errors do occur, they're detected and handled right away. For example, the launch and recovery operations aboard an aircraft carrier require split-second timing and the coordination of hundreds of people. In this environment, the tolerance for error is low, and expectations for performance are high. This organization works continuously to reduce the frequency of error as a standard part of the job. Now let's look at another organization and how they deal with human error. This unit of Special Forces soldiers is preparing for a counterinsurgency mission here, they're rehearsing to target and interdict key guerrilla lines of communication. Oh. Oh. I got the bag! Moving. Let's go! Fire in the hole! As part of standard operating procedure, they debrief the day's events against their performance objectives. Yep, so. I think so. Uh, Chris is here, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to facilitate the AAR. Basically, let's go over what, what was the plan, what was supposed to happen. Rob, you want to? Okay. plan was, obviously, to capture the, uh, the courier the practice helps to assure that each member understands what happened and plans are made to improve the team's performance in the next engagement. During the debrief, the team reviews both good and substandard performance. Here, they focus on adherence to standard operating procedures, techniques and errors, and make plans to correct errors during the next engagement. What did happen? Rich, uh... Why don't we hear from you, because you were our right anchor. What did you see as you, well, actually, let's start with Chris, because you, you took the sniper shot, so. Had a, had a clear view of the objective. The only thing I felt like is I was way too close to the target. Uh -huh. I, I felt like I'd have wanted to have been farther back out over in the trees or something, but identified the target, identified the bag, and took the shot. I think I hit the knee. Even though some of these soldiers are participating as instructors, they all continuously work as students to learn. 
That's because this soldier and the organization he works for understands an undeniable truism. Regardless of the latest technological advancements in equipment and weaponry, the most versatile and important tool in this dynamic, high-risk work environment is his own mind. Here we see another high-risk work environment. Only this isn't a training exercise. This is the real thing. And here, as in any extreme environment, the chances for error are high and the potential consequences are grave. Because wildland fire is a dynamic, high-risk, and sometimes extreme environment, it makes sense that you, as a firefighter, should know yourself as well as your technical tools. And that, in a nutshell, is the purpose of this program. To familiarize you with a mental tool set and to help you understand your responsibility for using these tools so you can work effectively as part of a team operating in a high-risk environment. Now, what do I mean by your responsibility? In the extreme environments we saw earlier, those people understood a professional duty. And the duty isn't about simply showing up and being there. It's about minimizing unnecessary risk, executing plans, and adapting to changes as they occur. A professional is always aware of their situation and learns to recognize the factors that are most important. A professional is part of the team, working with other people again and again in an environment that poses many hazards and challenges, doing it right and without unnecessary risk. A professional takes on the responsibility to think, to learn from their experiences, and to do a better job each day. This aspect of the job never ends, and it's sometimes the hardest part of the job. Hi, welcome to Human Factors on the Fire Line. During this session, I'll be one of your guides as we talk about a series of human performance concepts designed specifically for you, a wildland firefighter. There are three basic objectives for this program. The first is awareness. Now, by that, I mean recognizing and understanding some of the basic human performance issues and problems when you encounter them on the line. The second is tools. Just as there's a set of tools for every tactic we employ on the line, there's also a mental tool set for many of the common human problems we encounter. And the third is practice. As you all know, mastering any tool takes a lot of time and practice. These mental tools are no different. So throughout the course of this program, we'll be taking some time to try out a few of these tools so you can get a feel for them. Before we get started, let me put a couple things on the table. First, this isn't a safety program. Although many of the topics we'll be discussing have obvious safety ramifications, the focus here is on doing things correctly and minimizing error. Safety is a result of doing things correctly. Secondly, this program is not about fixing a problem. It's simply about making you aware of some tools and concepts that can make you better at what you're already trained to do, fighting fire. Take a look at this example. Here at the U.S. Navy Top Gun School, professional Navy pilots, pilots who are already flying combat missions, are taken back to school to learn how to be the very best pilots. In this school, every maneuver, action, tactic, and technique is broken down into its primary pieces and then reassembled again with a better understanding. Pilots learn not only what to do, but also why they do it. This better understanding helps them to improvise, react, and be more effective in this dynamic environment. In a sense, this program does the same thing on a smaller scale. You've been dealing with human factors since you were born. You're well acquainted with many common human factors. You know them as stressed out, tired, frustrated, or overloaded. Here, we'll take these familiar factors, break them down, and talk about them. Then, later on, we'll put them all back together again and apply them to your work on the fire line. 
The success of a program like this depends on a team effort. I'll be responsible for demonstrating some of these concepts, as will your instructor. And your instructor will provide plenty of opportunities for you to discuss the concepts and apply them to your individual circumstances. To do this, you'll work through a series of exercises with others in your class. And you'll be asked to think about your individual situation and identify some tools or techniques to improve your fireline performance. Finally, you'll be given an opportunity to try some of these tools. This mental tool set will include techniques to improve communication in high-risk situations, including specific communication responsibilities, a self-check for your situation awareness, a risk management decision aid, and basic teamwork guidelines. By the time we finish today, you'll have a better grasp of what can cause human errors in your work and what you can do to anticipate and mitigate them. You'll have some good ideas about how to make yourself a better firefighter. And you'll have some tools to help you accomplish that. So, without any further delay, let's get going. This pilot is en route to a mission to bomb an enemy radar site. And if you think there isn't much going on right now, think again. During this mission, the pilot keeps a mental picture of his relative position in space through use of the plane's instrumentation and using outside references if they're available. He constantly updates his mental image of his position relative to the target, the changes in the terrain, enemy threats, and even the air tanker that will refuel him after he's completed his mission. Although the environment is real, the way the pilot reacts to the changes in the environment is based totally upon his perception. If his perception of the situation doesn't include all the critical factors, such as an enemy missile heading his way, then too bad, so sad, as the pilots say. Reality always wins in the end. Understandably, he's motivated to make his perception of the environment match reality as closely as possible. And how well his perception matches reality is called situation awareness, or SA. So how does situation awareness work? The fire doesn't change because of how you perceive it. The fire changes, in part, based on what actions you take or don't take. The action you take depends on the decisions that you make and what you decide is based on how you perceive the situation. If you don't have a good grasp of the situation, your decisions and actions probably won't be effective in the real environment. We're going to get into decision making later in the program, but right now, let's take a close look at situation awareness, since it's at the root of everything an effective firefighter does. Everyone starts with an initial perception of what's going on. This initial perception forms as the result of your past experience and your current attitudes. But your initial perception is only a starting point. Continuously, you gather new information, updating and changing your perception of the situation. When you sat down to view this program, you had an initial perception. Call it a size up about the program. This will probably be a drag, or this should be interesting. Between then and now, you've continuously updated your assessment, gathering more information and changing it as appropriate. This cycle is called the Situation Awareness, or SA cycle, and it continues as long as you're awake. Everyone has some level of Situation Awareness. Paying attention is one part of Situation Awareness, but another part of it is knowing what to pay attention to, knowing what's important. Here are some homeowners fighting fire to protect their property. As inexperienced firefighters, most of these people don't know what things to look for or how to identify dangerous problems. No matter how hard they work physically today, the situation awareness and the effectiveness of these new firefighters will not be good. Until they know and understand more, they'll depend on intuition and luck to keep them out of harm's way information must be continuously gathered into the situation awareness cycle to keep it up to date. During this process, you take in new information from a variety of external sources. Most sources fall under two general categories. Information you observe directly and information that's communicated to you from others. 
Without new information, your situation awareness cycle will go stale. In the perfect world, our situation awareness would encompass every factor in the environment, but that isn't realistic. On the fire line, many things compete for our attention. Distraction is a real problem. Also, we can't directly observe or understand all the information that constantly bombards us. To handle the load, our brains naturally filter out parts of the environment that we deem as not important. When you're working on a fire, what pieces of information do you gather to size up your situation?